Welcome to today's video. So today we're going to be talking about constipation and how to solve it. I'm not doing a video like how to manage it, how to do this, how to do that. Like we're solving this problem. Okay, this is a solvable problem. I've solved it. I actually have a formula here. This is a solution. You're not supposed to be constipated. It's actually very dangerous for you to stay constipated. It is it predisposes you to loads of different types of diseases. It's really just a, a, a bad sign. Know exactly what to do at the end of this video to fix your constipation. You're gonna have actionable steps. There's gonna be no like guesswork. It's gonna be like, okay, this is exactly what I do for my constipation to be solved. So constipation, how do we solve it? Well, first of all, if we're gonna solve a problem, we have to really clearly define the problem and understand what the problem actually is. You're never gonna be able to solve a problem that you don't understand. So we first have to really define it and look at what makes a what what makes a good bowel movement and what 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 happens to a bowel movement that causes it to lean towards that constipation side. So there's three physical factors and one emotional factor being the trauma. So today we're really covering the three physical factors and this will resolve the constipation for most people in, in most cases. You have to have some really severe trauma going on to cause uh, a constipation that isn't going to be resolved by by implementing these changes. So the three primary factors are the microbiome, they are electrolytes and hydration status in the body, and fiber. And it's not what you think. I'm not going to be telling you, I'm actually going to be telling you to do the opposite of what everybody tells you to do when we're looking at constipation. So if you go to like your, your GP and you're constipated, or if you follow even like alternative, but mostly like mainstream advice, it's like, oh, I'm constipated, take more fiber. We're doing, we're actually doing the opposite of that. So if you're constipated, we're going to be reducing fiber intake, but we're going to, we're going to talk about that down here. So fiber, but it's not what you think. It's, it's completely the, it's completely backwards. It's completely the other way around. <laughs> so I don't know how we managed to get to that point, but we did. So I'm going to walk you through these things here. So first of all, microbiome, what is the microbiome? You probably already know it's, it's a bit of a buzzword at the minute, but microbiome is the combination, the accumulation of organisms you have residing in your gut. So this is, this is bacteria, this is yeasts, this is fungus, this is protozoa, this is methanogens, this is worms and flukes and all different kinds of creepy crawlies and bugs. There's this, there's this ecosystem, this cohabitation of organisms that that inhabit your gut and they are what compromise, what, what, what create your, your microbiome. They're, that's what your microbiome is comprised of. So it's just made of all of these different organisms. And if your microbiome is off, you're going to have a problem with your bowel movements because of dry, of dry mass. So if we remove all of the moisture out, we're going to talk about moisture in the, obviously in the electrolytes and hydration. But if we take all of the moisture out of a, out of a bowel movement of the dry mass, about 80% of that is living and dead bacteria and other types of organisms. So if we're looking at, at poop, we have to look at well, what is poop actually made out of? And well, a large portion of it is electrolytes and hydration. If you take that component out, 80% of what's left is living and dead bacteria, and the other 20% is basically fiber. So we've basically, we've, we've basically like found out what a poo is made out of, which is these three things, and we're gonna walk through how we can return these things to balance if they've, they've come out of balance. So we've got the microbiome at the top, then we've got electrolytes and hydration. So the, the, as I was saying, so if you take all of the water out of the, the bowel movement, 80% of what's left is, is bacteria and the other 20% is fiber. But with that water component still in there, the majority of your, of your stool is actually, is actually water. But drinking more water isn't actually the solution here. And you've probably been told, oh, you're constipated, take more fiber and drink more water and you'll have the solution to your problem. And, and it doesn't work. And I'm gonna help you understand why that is. Because just drinking more water doesn't actually hydrate you. It's about getting the balance between water and electrolytes right in your body. And just drinking more water is gonna dilute your electrolytes. So you're gonna lose electrolytes in your body, which is gonna cause a massive uptake of electrolytes from your bowel movements. And electrolytes are, they're osmotic in nature, so they pull moisture towards them. So if you have low mineral status in your body, because you're drinking loads of water, all of that, all of those electrolytes that you eat in the food that you eat, they're gonna all get absorbed, and that's gonna pull all of the moisture out of your digestive system, and then you're gonna have hard, dry stool, because you've basically taken all of the electrolytes out, which means no water remains, and you have a hard stool. But we're gonna talk you through how to solve that just here. And finally, fiber. So 
the, the, the final component, the final ingredient of the perfect poop is, is fiber. But it's actually, prob I would say it's probably the least important ingredient. And it's, it's the bottom of this list. It's the, it's the, the, I would say it's the least important thing. And actually in most people's cases, it's probably the thing that's causing more problems than it's solving. It's important that we distinguish between the two different types of fiber. So we've got, you're gonna see this over here. So we've got S is soluble and in, which is insoluble. So all this means is these are different types of fibers that can either be dissolved in water or they don't dissolve. So the way that you could think about this would be, think about say for example, let's take, let's take a juicy fruit like a mango or a papaya. That flesh inside is very, is very like, it's full of water, it's very water rich. Think about like maybe a watermelon as well. These have more soluble fibers. Whereas if you're looking at like a kale leaf or bran flakes or something like that. These are really harsh, aggressive fibers. These are, these are the insoluble fibers. So again, think nuts and seeds, the outside shell of, of a sweet corn, for example. These are, the, these are insoluble fibers and these are actually the ones that are usually causing problems. So we're gonna be looking at how we can increase soluble fiber intake and decrease insoluble fiber intake. And that's generally, that's, that's how we're gonna solve it is by, by looking at these three things. So just before I start, I just need to make sure that this live is looking fantastic and I'm very well centered in the camera. I probably should have done this earlier. I usually do, but got a bit of, oh, sorry about that. Got a bit ahead of myself because I really like this topic. This is a really fun one for me to talk about. So everything looks great. If you have any questions for me, please let me know. I'm gonna answer all your questions towards the end of this video. So leave your questions. You're gonna leave today knowing completely how to solve this problem. So. Just before we, we slide into this, I wanna tell you a little bit about my journey through this. So you know this isn't just information I'm giving you, this is actually like real world applicable. So I was, I was so severely constipated. I would go for upwards of seven to 10 days without a bowel movement. And if you know what that's like, then I, I feel really sorry for you because I've been there as well and it's horrible. So for me, this was really connected with many of my other health conditions like autoimmune diseases, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. So uh, I would get body pains and aches and things as well. And what I would find is the longer I would hold the bowel movement, so as, as I would progressively get from like day four to day five to day six to day seven, my fatigue got worse, my autoimmune symptoms got worse, my pain in my body, so the fibromyalgic pains would also get worse and these things would build and build and build and build. And as soon as I had a bowel movement, the levels would drop. So the pain would drop. Autoimmune symptoms would drop. So I would get really dry eyes, Shudgen's syndrome, if you've heard of it. So I get really dry eyes, dry mouth, stuff like that. I'd have a bowel movement, it would, it would drop. And my energy would come back up. My mood would come back up just from having a bowel movement. And it's, this is why it's really important that we resolve constipation as a problem because this is how you detoxify your body. So if you're not going to the toilet, you are basically accumulating toxins all of the time. And all of these symptoms that I, that I described, the autoimmunity, the fatigue, the body pain, these were happening because my body was basically becoming saturated with toxicity. And when I would have a bowel movement, that was a big release. It would let a lot of that toxicity go and all of those symptoms would, would resolve. But for me, it got to the point where I was, as I said, bowel movement once, every, once a week, once every 10 days, it was, it was awful. And then I would go to the toilet and it, li literally every time I went to the bathroom was a traumatic event, you know? I would be terrified going in there because it was like battling to get it out. It was so hard, it was so small and dry, and it would, it would make my, my ass bleed like every time. I had horrible hemorrhoids. Like when you, when you go to the toilet and you just see like, you just look in the toilet and there's just blood. Like that is, that is fucking scary. That is terrifying. It, you, you, you see that in the toilet and you, you really think like, I am, I'm dying. And it's really scary. And yeah, the frequency wasn't that high. Sure, I was only going to the toilet once a week, so the, maybe there was a blessing there. But when I did go, I, I literally had like PTSD for, for days afterwards. And it's like, I'd feel, I'd, I'd finally get to the point where I could go to the toilet. And it's like, yay, I can go to the toilet so I can lower my autoimmunity and my fatigue and my pain. But oh my God, let's brace myself for this traumatic experience. And going into a bowel movement with that level of fear is, is not really gonna help with resolving constipation because obviously you need to relax to, to let it out. So that's where I was. This has, been a, this has been a progression over the years. So I have healed food sensitivities. I have been able to introduce lots of different things into my diet. Things have changed a lot. 
But throughout this trajectory, I reached a point where I was dependent on laxatives and enemas. So if I didn't use an enema or a laxative, I just would, I just literally did not go to the toilet. So this was quite a long period of time. This was like three or four years. So I was doing a salt flush every three days. They are horrible. They are disgusting. It's like drinking a tablespoon of salt with water. Did not enjoy that experience whatsoever, but it made my bowels move and it was the only thing that worked. So I did that. And I also did coffee enemas very, fairly frequently as well. And maybe we're going to touch on them a little bit down here. But coffee enema isn't so much about having a bowel movement. It's more about what it does in the liver. But again, as I said, we'll touch on that. We'll touch on that in a little bit later. So now I'm at a point where I can basically eat whatever I want. So I can eat within, within reason, you know, but even things like gluten, dairy, things that I had sensitivities to, so histamines and FODMAPs and stuff like that. I can eat, I can eat all of these foods again and I can have a bowel movement every single day without problem. Sometimes I have two, sometimes I have three. And I don't have to do half of this stuff anymore. Like one of the things we're gonna talk about down here is juicing. I haven't done juicing for, it's gotta be four months now at least, maybe five months. Cause it, I mean, it, it is kind of, kind of frustrating, but when you don't need it anymore, you don't have to do it. So I, I used this formula myself to get to this point and now I've healed the food sensitivities. My gut is way better. I don't have all of those like autoimmune problems. I don't have chronic fatigue syndrome. I don't have the fibromyalgia. I don't have any of that. All of that is resolved. And I'm able to go to a bowel movement. I'm able to go to the toilet and have a bowel movement at least once per day. It's very, very uncommon for me to not have a bowel movement. I think the last time I missed a bowel movement has been, has been months ago. So bowel movement every day. And sometimes it's two and sometimes it's three. So this is a big change, you know, and this isn't something that I've just seen myself. I've worked with several clients just in the last few months alone that we've implemented basically just the bare bones of this formula. So one thing that's really nice when I'm working with somebody one-to-one -one is we can optimize this quick, more quickly. So I've, I've got some general rules of thumb that we're gonna talk about with, with amounts, but when I can judge based on somebody's symptoms, it can help me extrapolate for them what's gonna be a more optimal time frame to move forward as, as quickly as possible without causing like adverse reactions. Uh, if you wanna know more about that, check my last video, it's called the Goldilocks Zone, the sweet spot for healing. So you heal as fast as possible, without any adverse effects. So that's a really cool video, but back to constipation. So, so this isn't just me talking about this. Like I sold this, this has been a problem that's been solved for me for, for years now, but I've been refining this and I really feel like I cracked it. You know, I got to a, to a place where it's like, it's like a repeatable formula. So I was like, okay, I have to share this. This is, this is too good not to share. So now I'm gonna share the, I'm gonna share this magical formula with you. But before we get to the formula, I just wanna walk you through this little little demonstration, this graph that we've got. So these are the, the traits of, of, of stool when you're constipated. So you can have dry stool, you can have hard stool, it can be small, large, and you can have a slow transit. And these are the changes to implement. So I've created this kind of, this kind of grid here. So you can determine, and this is a grid I want you to save. So if you if you have if you're going to do this, like if you if you if you've watched this far into the video, so you're you're already doing fantastic. If you've watched this far, I want you to come back through your through your constipation resolving process and look at this graph again. Because as you work on healing your constipation, as you implement some of these changes that we have down here, you're you're going to see your your stool change. So. As it changes, as it becomes less dry, you're gonna to need to modify it based on which things affect dryness. As it becomes, as it maybe it goes from being too small to too large, you need to implement different changes. And I've built this little table for you here so you can understand based on what your symptoms are and basically how your stool changes as to what changes you need to implement to bring them back to, to the perfect bowel movement. So, I'll give you a little demonstration. We'll just go through it with the microbiome column here. So in microbiome, we're gonna talk about how to support the microbiome down here with probiotics. With electrolytes, we're gonna talk about electrolytes down here. And with fiber, we're also gonna talk about fiber down here. But it's important to distinguish in fiber, we've got soluble and insoluble. These are two different types of categories of fiber. And it's just important that we distinguish them because they work very differently in the gut, especially when constipation is involved. So we'll start, we'll start with this one. So let's start with dry. So if you have dry stool, so if, you, if your stool is really dry, taking a probiotic, so working on the microbiome isn't gonna make much of a difference. Taking or working on the electrolyte side of things is gonna improve things, it's gonna make a, a good improvement. Adding in 
adding increased amounts of soluble fiber is also a good thing to do. So the up arrow means do it, it's good. This is gonna help. And on the last point here, you've got insoluble fiber. This is a down. This means don't do it. This means if you have dry stool, do not increase your insoluble fiber intake. You probably wanna actually decrease it. So I'll go to the next one. If your stools are hard, you will benefit from taking probiotics. You will benefit from supporting electrolytes. So again, so primarily this is gonna be juicing, but we have some other things to talk about electrolytes down here. You'll benefit from increasing your soluble fiber intake, and you will probably find that your insoluble fiber intake, you need to lower it if you wanna find a benefit. So on here, if it's an up arrow, it means it's good, it means do it, it means increase this. If it's neutral, it means it probably won't have that much of an effect. It, prob it may still have some effect, but it's not gonna be like a game-changing kind of effect. And if it's a down arrow, it means you need to do less of it. So generally speaking, the only time you see a down arrow is in the insoluble fiber column. And you'll see that it's almost always down arrows. The only time that more insoluble fiber is actually helpful is if you have small stools. And I would only suggest that you use insoluble fiber if your stu stools are small, but they're also not dry, they're not hard, Obviously they're, they're, they're not small because they're large, but they're, they're not slow as well. So the only time I would really add, or the only time I would increase insoluble fiber intake is if all of the other problems are solved, so they're, they're, they're coming out nicely, they're just very small. Then you would want, that's the only time that I would increase the insoluble fiber intake. Otherwise, you're almost universally gonna benefit from removing insoluble fiber. It's incredibly harsh, it's incredibly abrasive, it's it, it's literally like, think about, like, think about a kale leaf, think about an almond, you know? These things, like, if you rub them on the hands, like, they're tough, they're really abrasive, and they're doing the same in your gut, they're irritating. And if your gut is constipated, it's struggling. So putting stuff in there that's just irritating, and I mean, by definition, fiber is indigestible, so it's not even digestible anyway, you're just, you're just frustrating your gut, so just, just stop putting that in there. If your gut can handle all that and then your bowel movements are just a little bit small, that's when fi insoluble fiber can be helpful. But other than that, you're probably gonna to wanna to be reducing your, in your intake of, of, of that type of fiber. So this is a chart for you to keep and take away because as you implement these changes, things will change. Your bowel movements will change and you're gonna to need to know how, but what changes have made these things happen and what you need to do to change the approach that you're doing to, to, to continue staying at the, at the perfect bowel movement. So this is here. If you need this again, just come back to the video and use it. This is, this is gonna help you figure out how to constantly move towards the perfect bowel movement. So if you have any questions about using this, let me know, I'll answer them towards the end. But let's get onto the formula. This is the juicy stuff. This is the really good stuff that I wanna share with you. This is the, like, but I wouldn't say it's patented because uh, how can you patent something like this? But this is my tried and tested formula and I've really refined this over the years and I'm giving it to you in what I think will be the most universally applicable and beneficial and gentle way. So first of all, we're looking at probiotics. So this is, this is the microbiome pillar. So wherever you have a, a dysfunction in the microbiome, the solution is basically gonna be found in probiotics. I will include a link to I'll include a link to two probiotics that I really like. They're by the same brand. One of them is a good place to start if you have other types of chronic health problems. So if you've got, like, 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 like I was saying, if you've got autoimmunity, if you've got chronic fatigue syndrome, if you've got more than just, if it's like you're not just constipated, you're constipated and that's kind of the least of your problems because you have so many other problems as well, start with the gentle one. This will be the six strain formula. If, you, if constipation is, is just constipation is your problem, start on the 11 strain formula instead. That one's, it's better, it's a higher dose, it's more, more organisms, but it, because it's stronger, it's not as well tolerated to start with. And what's more important when we start is to just get the, the colony forming unit count up, even if it's a smaller amount of species. So I'll leave two links to the different types of probiotics in the, in the comments, in the description. I'll, I'll leave them somewhere. Obviously right now I'm doing this live, but I'll, I'll leave them somewhere, okay? And if I, if I forget, just reach out and ask me. So these are gonna be two, two different types of probiotics and we're gonna start on a really, really small amount. So the, we're gonna start on one small scoop. So the probiotics that I'm suggesting, so you can use any probiotic, right? I really like these. These are the ones that I've used. These are the ones that I use myself. These are the ones that I use with my clients. These, as far as I'm concerned, these are the best probiotics that you can buy. These are the best probiotics on the market. 
You can try doing this with other types of probiotics, but I can't promise you that they're going to work because I don't know what's I don't know what's in them. So, I'm talking about using these specific probiotics. I'm not affiliated with these. I'm not making any money from it. I would love to be. Like if I could be affiliated with them, I totally would because I've used them my whole healing process. I use them with all my clients. They are just the best probiotics on the market. And if I could be an affiliate, I would because I'd get to make some some decent money out of it. But they don't have an affiliate program, so I can't. So I don't make any money. So I'm not even incentivized to say it. And I'm still going to say they are the best ones. So they come with two different types of measurements. They come with a big scoop and a little scoop. The little scoop is meant for children and the, the big scoop is meant for adults. We're starting with the little one. We're starting with the little tiny one, okay? Because our guts are, they're like kids. They're gentle, we need to be gentle with them. So we're starting with the small scoop. The small scoop is the equivalent to about 25 billion colony forming units. And we're gonna start with one small scoop one once a day. So ideally first thing in the morning is, is best. First thing in the morning with, with water or if you eat your, eat your breakfast and then just have it at the end of your breakfast. So we're gonna take that, that one small scoop and we're just gonna do that every day for a week. And then at the end of that week, we're gonna try and increase by one extra scoop. And we're just gonna keep doing this every week for two months until we get to eight of the small scoops. At this point, eight of the small scoops is the equivalent of one of the big scoops. So when you've done, when you're doing eight of these small scoops, in a day, so this is gonna take seven weeks to get to this point, you're gonna do, then you're gonna be doing eight of these small scoops, you can swap to using the big scoop because they're the same measurement. So this is gonna mean that the end goal is to reach a total of approximately 250 billion, so this is quite a high dose of probiotics, 250 billion CFUs per day. This is, as I said, of dry mass, 80% of your stool is living and dead bacteria. So if we don't have enough of the right bacteria in there, you're just going to, you're not going to be able to have a good bowel movement because your bowel movement is made of living and dead bacteria. So this, this component here is really designed to put those organisms back in your gut. These are the organisms that you're supposed to have. These are, these are basically lactobacillus and bifidobacterium species. These are organisms that are present in healthy microbiomes of every single indigenous culture on the planet. So these are present in North America, in South America, in in Europe, in Asia, in Australia, the Inuit, all of these different countries, they all have these organisms in. These are essential organisms. These, these literally cannot be disease-causing organisms. These are essential. These are the right organisms to have in the gut. If you have reactions to them, so if it makes constipation worse or it flares up all of your other health problems, you're going too fast. So this is, this is, a, this is a guide, you know? I don't know your, your personal health situation. And even if I did, I still couldn't give you medical advice. So you have to listen to your body. For me, like this, is, I'm being optimistic here. This is where I find most people are at. For me, to get to eight scoops, it took me two and a half years. But as I said, I was dealing with a, a whole bunch of different other chronic health problems. So I had a lot more going on than, than just constipation. If you just have constipation, you can probably do it faster than this. I've had clients get to eight small scoops in, in a month. So that's like twice as fast as I'm labeling here. And I've had some do it in a week, you know? I, I, I don't advise it, but I mean, people wanna heal fast, so they, they jump, they try to take shortcuts. And sometimes they pay for it as well. I had another client that took a higher dose than, than was, a, was a good idea, and they felt really bad for it. So you have to be careful with these things. These are very, very powerful. Just because they're supplements doesn't mean that they're not, they're not powerful, okay? So these are very powerful probiotics. So I would say, on average, you'd probably be okay starting with one small scoop and increasing by one small scoop every week for eight weeks until you reach eight small scoops and then you're at an adult sized scoop. And that's a good place to stay. It's generally considered safe for basically the whole population. Obviously, if we're working with kids, work with somebody, it's more complicated with kids, but general rule of thumb, okay? So again, it's really hard to say because everybody's so individual and so different, but general formula, Start with one small scoop, increase by one small scoop every single week until you reach eight small scoops. Pretty simple formula, okay? Let me know if you have any questions about that. Next, we're gonna move on to juicing. So juicing is, without doubt, one of the most powerful healing modalities on the planet for many different types of health problems, but especially for constipation. For two reasons. You get a good balance of electrolytes and you provide yourself with soluble fiber. So you'll notice here, electrolytes and soluble fiber are never contraindicated. So Whenever you can take electrolytes, soluble fiber is also gonna be beneficial. And if it, it's either gonna be beneficial or neutral. So it's, there's never an up and a down. So if you need electrolytes, 
taking soluble fiber is going to be helpful. If you need soluble fiber, electrolytes are also going to be helpful. And juicing is the best way to do this because we're concentrating all of the soluble fiber and all of the electrolytes that are available in fresh vegetables, combining them into, so you're taking like a whole celery plant or a whole pack of carrots that you'd never be able to eat in one go. You're taking all of that nutrition, all of those electrolytes, all of that soluble fiber and turning it into this little tiny cup that you can just drink it in one go. Like you could have it with your meal, you can have it in between meals. It's so, it's so easy. You can just dose yourself up on electro, there's so many more benefits, okay? You're getting the soluble fiber, you're getting the electrolytes, but you're also getting polyphenols, you're getting different types of antioxidants, different types of phytochemicals. Like there's so much good stuff in, in plants. And when you juice it, you concentrate it. One thing I will say is you're concentrating everything. So when you're juicing, it's really important you use organic produce because you're concentrating everything. You're concentrating the good, all of these electrolytes, all of the soluble fiber. You're also concentrating the bad. So if these vegetables have been sprayed with pesticides, if you juice it, you're concentrating those pesticides. So you're getting a, a concentrated dose of pesticides, which is not gonna help with balancing the microbiome because all pesticides are antibiotic. They all kill bacteria. So if you concentrate, the, the pesticides, you're gonna be basically taking like a concentrated antibiotic, which is not gonna help with this microbiome diversity pillar. So you have to make sure when you're juicing, you're using organic produce, it's, it's really important. So when we do this, we're providing the body with everything that it needs to basically formulate. If you combine these two, so the, the, the probiotic and the juicing, this is everything you need to produce a bowel movement. You've got the right hydration, so you're getting, you're getting water, because this is, and this is good water. If it's water that's been extracted from a vegetable, it's the best kind of water you can get. It's basically distilled water, rain water, that the plant has then restructured inside itself. It's the most bioavailable form of water that you can possibly get. You cannot beat nature when it comes to these things, and juicing, you're just getting all of that, all of that, all of that water. But this water is also combined with the appropriate blend of electrolytes. So you're getting your potassium, your magnesium, selenium, your zinc, all of your different types of micronutrients, especially the electrolytes, being the magnesium and the potassium that are most important. So you're getting all of this. So you're getting the hydration, but you're also getting the electrolyte component of it as well. It's also worth noting, noting now, while we're talking about electrolytes, stop drinking water if you're not thirsty your body is so much smarter than you are, it knows exactly how much water it needs. And when it needs water, it will tell you to drink water by you being thirsty. Your, your body has biofeedback mechanisms in it. It tells you when it needs food, you feel hungry. It tells you when it needs water, you feel thirsty. If you drink water when you're not thirsty, you deplete your electrolyte status, you will cause constipation, you're putting extra work on your kidneys, they don't need that extra work, they could be doing other jobs. So. Listen to your body, it's so much smarter than you are. Listen to it as it tries to tell you how it's trying to heal you. You know, it's trying to keep you healthy every second of every day, but you keep doing things that it isn't asking you to do. Like, do the things that it asks. So, if you're thirsty, absolutely drink. If you're not thirsty, don't drink. I would say exception to this, so that's with water. The exception to this is with juice, because when you're having the juice, you're providing the full spectrum of everything that you need. It's basically like, it's like a blood transfusion, you know? You're providing your body with everything that it needs. It's, the water is structured, the water is healthy. You've got the electrolytes, you've got all of these other antioxidants, you've got all these other beneficial compounds. So it's, it's, it's different than just, than just drinking water. Just drinking water when you're not thirsty is a recipe for disaster. I discourage you from doing that. Trust your body, it's smarter than you are. It's smarter than I am, it's smarter than we all are. It knows what it's doing. So. When we juice, we're providing a concentrated source of soluble fiber and of electrolytes. And you, you just can't beat this. It is just, it's hands down, it's the simplest and best way to do it. Yeah, we can look at like taking a soluble fiber supplement and we can look at mixing electrolyte powders to try and get the right mix. It's like, who, who, care, who has time for that, you know? Healing is simple, it's a simple process. So stop making it complicated. Let's just juice the stuff that we've already been provided by nature, concentrate all the good stuff, give ourselves the soluble fiber and electrolytes in the right balance and just drink it. Like it's easy, it's simple, don't make it hard, it doesn't have to be. So there's other ways to do this. If you're one of those unlucky few that has food sensitivities or you have intolerances to certain plant chemicals, then probably don't do this. But, and you're gonna have to find the more complicated route. But for most people, just juice is so easy. So what do we juice? That's a good question. Honestly, you can juice whatever you want. It's really not, it's not gonna make that much difference. What I would suggest is, generally going for lower carbohydrate juice. So I wouldn't juice fruit so much. 
I'd focus more on like celery, cucumber, or a really good base. I would layer on top of that some, some greens, maybe some kale, some, some chard. I wouldn't juice spinach. It's very high in oxalate. I generally wouldn't eat spinach raw, but especially juicing it because you're concentrating everything, you're gonna get a lot of oxalates. I'd say that's probably the one thing not to juice. If you're gonna juice herbs, which you absolutely can, so you can juice like mint, you can do rosemary, thyme, basil, all of these things, they are very powerful. These herbs are used to flavor food because they have a very strong flavor. If you juice them, it will overpower the juice. So just be careful with the amount that you add. Two other things that are really cool to add would be ginger. Again, it's a spice. Don't use too much, it's very powerful. It will make the thing fiery hot. I, I, I remember drinking one that was just, had too much ginger. It will, <laughs> it will make your belly burn. It is fiery. It will, for me, it makes my ears itch <laughs> in the back of my head. It's strange. But that's a good one to add. And lemon is also amazing as well. You're gonna get a nice gallbladder squeeze with that acidity from the lemon. You might find you wanna peel it though because the, the rind can add a bit of bitterness to the, the skin can add bitterness to the juice, which isn't very nice. So if you're gonna do lemon, probably peel it first and then chuck it in the juicer. If you need to sweeten it a little bit, carrots are a really good option. You can also go with sour apples, like Granny Smith apples, they're also a really good option. If you need to add a bit of fruit, then do it. You know, a bit of sugar isn't gonna kill you. It's gonna be fine. It's more important to actually get your bowel, bowel movements functioning again. And if the juice is so disgusting that you can't drink it, then do whatever you need to to make yourself be able to drink it. But I find that a little bit of carrot, a little bit of apple, and the lemon and ginger, it's actually surprisingly nice. You know, I, I, I tell this to my clients, and they're like, that sounds horrible. They, they, give it, they give it a try, and they're like, that's actually not that bad, you know, I kind of like it. And, it. and it grows on you over time, especially when you start going to the toilet again as well. You're like, cool, this is my, my, my poo juice. It makes me feel really good. So you can really juice whatever you want. Work around your food sensitivities if you have them. It's not, honestly, it's not really that important. Most you're gonna get 90% the same thing in, in most vegetables. You, they're all gonna have the water, they're all gonna have a different blend of electrolytes. For electrolytes, generally, celery, cucumber are good because they've got high water content, they also have electrolytes in, and then greens on top of that as well can be helpful. So again, all greens, just maybe not spinach. So optimally, we're gonna to push towards one liter a day. Some people get to like 650 milliliters, 850 milliliters, and they're like, their bowel movements are perfect. So at that point, just stop. This is something you have to pay attention to. So I would start with 250 milliliters. That's about one glass, like one kind of like normal sized glass. Start on that, gradually increase your intake over time. And so here we've got 250 milliliters increased by 250 milliliters a week. So this would basically be increasing, start on 250 for a week, increase by 250 milliliters every week. So you go for 250, 500, 750 a liter. So you'd get to that point in, in about a month. But what I find is you might reach a spot where you're like, cool, I'm not constipated anymore. Stay there. That's your indicator that you're at a good spot. If you push past that, you probably get diarrhea. If you get diarrhea, that means you've just done a little bit too much. So just dial it back a little bit and you'll normalize back on the perfect bowel movement. This can cause diarrhea, especially when we start, because your body's not used to having all of these electrolytes and it doesn't know how to uptake them so quickly. Also, the rapid increase in soluble fiber can draw extra excess moisture into the bowel and your microbiome might not be used to this kind of, these kind of fibers in the gut. This is why I'm suggesting that you start on 250 milliliters and, and increase it. As you're increasing it, you could either do 250 milliliters four times a day, or if you're able to tolerate it, you could do 500 milliliters twice a day. I had one client that did one liter once a day and they were fine with that. If I do that, I get diarrhea, so I don't do that. So I would split it into maybe three or four portions throughout the day. So you're gonna work that up slowly and you're gonna modify that based on how you feel. So if you get belly cramps, if you get diarrhea, you've, it's either too much or you've increased it too quickly. So just reduce the amount or reduce the speed that you're increasing it by. So just those two alone, most people will probably be fine. For the, next, for the next people that have done these things, they still have problems. This is the next thing that we're gonna add. So this is step three. So we're gonna remove the insoluble fiber from the diet as much as possible. So this is the insoluble fiber com column over here. So if you have dry, hard, large, and slow bowel movements, so they're dry and hard, and they're large and they have a slow transit time, or if they're any combination of any of these, you probably wanna reduce your insoluble fiber intake. So these are mostly found in nuts and seeds, especially if they haven't been prepared properly, but even, even if they have, so even if they've been soaked and sprouted, I'd probably still cut them out. Nutritionally, they don't provide that much and they really exacerbate constipation. So nuts and seeds, 
and the different types of insoluble fibers. So I would generally be looking at raw things. So if you think about a kale leaf, raw it is so, you could chew it for literally forever and it would never break down. And that's actually true because it's mostly cellulose, which is completely indigestible. But then if you imagine you took that same piece of kale and you boiled it in a soup for like an hour and a half and you blended it up, you're going to reduce the insoluble fiber content a lot. So generally what I would try to do is focus on reducing insoluble fibers. So the, generally don't eat raw stuff or reduce the amount of raw food that you're eating. You're still going to be getting enough of these nutrients because you're doing the juicing as well. So when you're juicing, you're going to be still getting all of the nutrients that you need from, from raw food but we're gonna be trying to remove the, the insoluble fiber. If this is also a problem for you, when you're, when you're doing juicing, as the juice is coming out, it's gonna collect a lot of pulp in the top and the juice may actually have some pulp in it as well. If you are trying to reduce your insoluble fiber intake down as low as possible, you can also filter the juice through a sieve and then through a cheesecloth as well, or a nut milk bag, or some kind of like muslin cloth. So you can remove any of that excess insoluble fiber that's raw and very, very harsh and very, very constipating. So we can work on removing raw vegetables and stuff from, from the diet, especially the ones that you notice are really hard. So like nuts, seeds, um, like raw salad. So you, you have a general idea of what is hard to digest. Think about the difference between raw and cooked as well. So I'm not saying don't eat any vegetables. I'm saying maybe instead of eating like raw carrots, which could be, you can imagine, kind of a bit hard. If you have carrot soup, like if you boil a carrot for 20 minutes, you chew it and it, it just melts, you know? So this is changing the fiber content of these, of these foods significantly. So I'm not saying don't have any. If you're really constipated, probably don't have anything raw. But if, if you have some level of tolerance, like just reduce, just don't have so many, don't have so much peanut butter, don't have so many salads, you know? Try to swap your salad for soup. Try to reduce the insoluble fiber content in your diet and you will see that this really changes your bowel movements a lot. And with those three changes alone, I would say 90% of the people watching this, like you probably don't have constipation anymore. You, you're gonna have to give it some time, you know, you're gonna have to stick with this for, so to get to this maximum dose, we'll be looking at two months. So if you stick with these things and you do this for two months, I would be, I would be strongly predicting complete resolution of constipation. But there will be a few people that still have some, some lingering issues. So what can we do? There are extra steps. So I would say these are additional. I would only, I would maybe maybe pick and choose some of these things based on, based on yourself and what feels right to you. But I would say these, so these two are the core. These two are the most important things. If these two are not alone aren't doing it, I would also do this. So I'd reduce the insoluble fiber intake. I would reduce nuts and seeds. Uh, maybe even remove them, they're the hardest ones. And then I would look at uh, reducing like raw, raw food intake as well. So things like salads, and I'd be getting all of the raw nutrients through the, through the juicing. And so these additional things that we can look at. So we can use a digestive enzyme. Digestive enzymes can be really helpful. If you've got any type of fatigue condition, so like chronic fatigue syndrome, adrenal fatigue, if you feel like you just don't really have energy and you're also constipated, digestive enzyme, really good idea. I'll, I'll leave a link to a digestive enzyme that I like. I'll also tell you what it's called. I really like the enzyme called Lipogold by Enzymedica. I really like these because they're, they're safe for long-term use because they only contain the pancreatic enzymes that we produce naturally. So this is amylase, protease, and lipase. Lots of other digestive enzymes have things like pectinase and these other types of like cellulase. And we don't really want these enzymes because these are enzymes that are supposed to be produced by our microbiome. So if we take these as a supplement, we kind of starve our microbiome of food, which means we lose gut flora diversity, which is really a bad thing. So I like the Lipogold by Enzymedo because they just have the three, again, not affiliated, would love to be, but I'm not. But so these are the ones I would suggest because they just contain the, the protease, the amylase and the lipase, which are the ones that are gonna support your digestion the most. This, the, these can be a real, a real game changer. So if this alone isn't doing it, I'd consider putting a digestive enzyme in. We can look at magnesium as well. So magnesium is, is one of those core electrolytes. So the two being magnesium and potassium. If you have like a lot of stress, if you find it very hard to calm down, if you've got other symptoms of magnesium deficiency, first of all, juicing is gonna be providing a lot of magnesium. But if that alone isn't enough, we can look at using a magnesium supplement. I'd probably be looking at using this before bed because this can really help you sleep as well. 
I like to use a supplement that has multiple different forms of magnesium. So I don't have a specific brand that I like right now. The one that I get is a German one. I have no idea what it's called. But if you're buying a magnesium supplement, I would try to look for a supplement that has seven or eight different forms of magnesium. And you don't really want the ones that are like chloride, sulfate. You don't want the ones that are kind of bound with minerals. You want the, bounds, the ones that are bound to amino acid chelates. So some good examples would be like magnesium malate, magnesium taurate, magnesium glycinate or bisglycinate. These ones that end in, in A and they're, 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 amino, they're amino acid bound. These are the ones you really want. These are the ones that are more effective. They're more bioavailable. They're gonna work more in the, in the body. They're gonna be absorbed better, which is gonna help. And they have different jobs in the body as well. So try and find a magnesium supplement that has a lot of different forms of magnesium is just generally going to be better in, in, all different, in all different aspects. We've got Epsom salts here as well. This can be a really good one if you're, if you're already um, struggling with, with bowel tolerance with the juice, but you feel like you still need to get some extra, you still need to get some extra magnesium into you. If you also feel stressed and if you have, if you have like belly cramps and things like this, this one can, can be really helpful because we're putting Epsom salts in a hot bath. So we're getting the benefits of the heat therapy, which can really help with motility in the gut. But the Epsom salts are also really good because we're providing a bioavailable for form of magnesium, but we're also providing the sulfate. So Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate. This sulfate can be really helpful with improving bile flow, with supporting liver health. So if we're having problems with constipation because the bile is unhealthy, this one can be really helpful. And this is where these last two points tie in really as, as well. So eating a high fat diet and doing coffee enemas. These can be really helpful with constipation if the constipation is primarily being caused by either a bile insufficiency or um, a lack of good, good quality bile, if the bile health is, is compromised. So the Epsom salts, the sulfate component, you're also gonna be getting a lot of sulfur components from the juicing too, so that can be really helpful. The high fat can stimulate the gallbladder to release. So the liver creates bile, it's stored in the gallbladder, the fat in the diet triggers the gallbladder to release, and that bile is a really important part of allowing us to have a healthy bowel movement. It really lubricates the bowel, the bowel so the, the stool can move through properly. It's how we digest all of our fat. It's really important. So having a high fat diet can, can stimulate, that can be a, a really helpful thing to add in on top of this. And if that isn't enough as well, you can use coffee enemas, or you could just use enemas in general. So just getting relief from constipation is really important. If you're going more than three days without a bowel movement, that is really dangerous. It's really bad for your health. Your accumulating toxicity is not a good thing. So just using enemas in general can be a very safe and immediately effective way to, to relieve your, your bowels. They do not create dependency. That is not true. I had those fears myself. I was like, I'm going to be dependent on laxatives and enemas forever. My, bow my bowels are going to forget how to work. They're going to get lazy. They don't do that. Your, your, your body's not stupid. It knows how to do these things. It just needs to be provided with the right environment and the right resources. And if for some reason, all of this, or if you're like, so this, as I said, this can take two months to fully implement. If you're at the point where you're like, well, I've, it's two weeks and I haven't had a bowel movement, an enema is a really good option. And we can use coffee enemas to help to stimulate the, the bile flow even further, which can help if one of the, the leading causes of this constipation is a, a bile problem. So this, this bile problems occur usually when you're exposed to like mycotoxins or um, some kind of fat soluble toxin in your environment, maybe amalgams, merc mercury in your teeth, things like that, different types of environmental fat soluble toxin exposures. So that can be really helpful there. So that's basically everything. So let's just, let's just recap. So top to bottom, so three biggest things, the microbiome, electrolytes, hydration, fiber. You've got this graph here. You can refer back to this whenever you need it. Seriously, come back. I'm gonna keep this video here. I'm also gonna put this on YouTube. So if you ever lose the video, you can just type my name, William Dickinson, constipation on YouTube. This video will come up, you will find this graph. So you know how to use this. If you have any questions about how to use this, just leave me a comment. Start with one, probiotics, 250 billion CFUs a day is the goal. We're gonna start on one small scoop, so about 25 billion, and we're gonna to try to increase by one small scoop every single week till we get to eight small scoops, and then we can move to the big scoop. I'll include the links to the probiotics below. If this makes you feel bad, slow down. If this makes you have diarrhea or it makes you more constipated, also slow down. This is a process that takes time. With the juicing, you can juice whatever works for you. I would suggest, so this is my, my basic template for a juice formula, would be celery or cucumber with a little bit of carrot and 
Granny Smith sour apple to sweeten it a little bit, combined with some lemon and ginger. This is gonna be a really powerful combination. We're aiming for getting towards a liter a day. We're gonna start with 250 milliliters and we're gonna increase by 250 milliliters every single week. So this is gonna take four weeks to reach the total dose. If you get diarrhea, go back a little bit. If you get digestive discomfort, if you have problems happening in the gut, you've probably gone too fast or you're probably drinking too much in one go and you need to reduce the amount that you're having. Finally, we're gonna remove and reduce. So I would encourage remove nuts and seeds and reduce all of the other types of insoluble fibers. So nuts and seeds, legumes, beans, pulses, peas, things like that, remove them and reduce the amount of other types of insoluble fibers. So this is like, like tomatoes and lettuce, for example. I mean, you, probably, you don't really eat lettuce cooked, but tomatoes, for example, try and have them as a tomato soup or carrots, try and have them as a soup. So we're gonna remove or reduce the amount of those insoluble fibers which can actually contribute towards constipation. Who would have guessed it? I mean, you go to the doctor, they say, here you go, here's a fiber supplement, and this is an insoluble fiber supplement, and I'm telling you to do the exact opposite. And I, this, as I said, tried and tested, this works. So we've really got that fiber thing backwards. It's the wrong type of fiber. And finally, you've got some extra things that you can try down here. Digestive enzymes, these ones, this would be the place I would start if you need extra support. These are really cool, especially if you have a fatigue condition, can be really helpful. Magnesium and excellent salts, these can give, be a good source of magnesium. And if you have, uh, if you know that part of your constipation is being fueled by having a, a bile problem, bile insufficiency, liver function problem, high fat and coffee enemas can be, can be really helpful. So I'm just gonna check now, see if you have any questions. If you're, if you're watching this after it was live and you have questions, please leave me the questions, I will answer them, okay? I love answering your questions. It's, it's really helpful. It's really helpful for me because it helps me understand where you need help and it helps me get you the, the information that you're looking for. So Wanda says, how much water a day is a good amount? This really depends on the individual and you're really basically just gonna have to drink as much as you feel thirsty for. You're probably gonna find that if you're drinking a liter of juice a day, and you probably, maybe you're having some soup as well, you're probably not gonna be that thirsty. At this point now, I don't drink a liter of juice a day. I just drink water. I can, I'll probably do between 800 milliliters and a liter and a half of water. And I maybe have two, two warm drinks as well. So like cups of tea or something like that. But it, it's very much based on the individual. It's really as simple as drink when you feel thirsty and stop when you don't feel thirsty. And if you feel thirsty and you drink and you still feel thirsty, it's not a water thing, it's an electrolyte thing. So drink more juice instead. The juice is gonna be your best source of electrolytes. Good question though, really like it. Sarah says, take all the juice in one go or split throughout the day. I would definitely split it up. I would go for at least, at least into two, but I found that th three was what worked for me or maybe four. So this is like, you could either do four times 250 milliliters or three times 333 milliliters or two times 500 milliliters. But having it more frequently throughout the day is gonna be better because it's not gonna trigger digestive discomfort. So maybe you can have a little bit with each meal and you can have a little bit in between meals as well. Maybe that's probably the best way to go about it. This isn't, this is actually quite okay to have with meals because it's basically like a salad just with all of the fiber removed. I know it's a bit of a funny way to think about juice, but it's basically a salad with the fiber removed. So it's okay to have with food. Um, do we have, Sarah says, on an empty stomach. So as I, as I was just saying, you can drink this in between meals. You can have a little bit with meals. I wouldn't drink too much with meals because again, like I said, it's, you're concentrating so much down. You wouldn't eat that much in a meal. So you can have a little bit to sip on with your meal, but I would generally drink it in between that throughout the day. Uh, Angela Bates says, do you did you mention the probiotics that you use? Yes, I did. And I'm also gonna leave links to this in the comments below and I'm gonna add them to the description as well at the end of the video. And if you wanna reach out to me personally, send me a DM and I'll, I'll give you the link personally. Sarah Taylor says, does high fat not feed certain troublesome bacteria? So I actually find this to be, so I know exactly where you're going with this, Sarah. You're talking about the, the bilophilia and what's worthier organisms and the other hydrogen sulfide producing organisms that like to eat bile. The thing is, I see this again and again, these organisms are an adaptive response. They're present because they're helping you to clean the bile. So it's gonna be really important that we work on recycling that bile and cleaning it and making sure that the bile health is high, making sure the quality of the bile is high because the bile is how we bind and remove all fat soluble toxins from our body. So this is mercury, this is mycotoxins, this is plastics, this is, estro this is any estrogenic compounds, this is pesticides like glyphosate, this is so many different chemicals that we're exposed to. 
So if the bile is unhealthy and it's full of toxicity, we will develop organisms that like to eat bile as an adaptive response. So they can help us remove this toxicity from our body. As soon as you remove that source of toxicity, the organism that likes to eat the bile will disappear because it doesn't have a job anymore. It doesn't need to be there. So this is one reason that making sure that you're not constipated is so important because if you're constipated, you are storing toxicity. You are accumulating toxicity, which is gonna put more toxins in the bile, which is gonna predispose you to these kinds of dysbiosis. So it's really important that we get constipation solved. You know, this is so important. This is like a fundamental part of healing basically all chronic disease. If you have constipation, you need to be looking there. You know, you need to be looking in the gut and you need to be getting your bowels moving. Really important. Hope that answers your question, Sarah. So that is everything for today's video. As I said, if you do have questions afterwards, please do let me know. I'll make sure I answer all of them. And that's everything for me. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for coming. Ciao. See you, everybody.